You're listening to Play Callers. New episodes dropping every Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. Available to stream across all platforms. Also, be sure to check out the Tiger's Den Podcast. New episodes dropping every Monday at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. Available to stream across all platforms. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Play Callers. Today we are talking to the offensive line coach, Coach Jeremy Stanford. Uh, coach, how are you doing on this uh, fine morning um, with college football this Saturday and you know, Auburn University playing later tonight? I'm doing great. Hoping that, uh, hoping that Auburn can get a win tonight on the road. Yeah, it's going to be a very big game. Uh, I'm going to get to my uh, three questions here. Um, first question is, uh, what have you guys been working on in practice this week uh, to get ready for this big game against Central this Friday? It's really just working on the basics, uh, especially up front. I've, we've worked on a lot of fundamental stuff that a lot of times uh, during the season you don't get a chance to do because you, you're always preparing for somebody. So we had to actually, you know, this being the bye week, we had a little extra time to, to spend to actually work on some fundamental things where we could get better uh, on some things that maybe we needed to get better at that, you know, you just don't have as much time during a game week to work on. Yeah. Well, I know you all have a very experienced O-line and um... – Talking about that O line, do you think uh, you guys could be able to create holes for Omar and uh, Tyler during the game against Central? Uh, yes, I, I think we can. You know, our offensive lines play well this year. We've got better week in and week out. I think you know our backs this year do a really good job of seeing the hole, so if we can find a little crease uh, there. I think our backs do a really good job of, of hitting it. Uh, it's going to be a tough challenge. Their their defensive line is really really good up front. Uh, they yeah. play a lot of different guys. They play up to. I think in the Opelika game I watched the first half, they played uh, 10 guys out of their four spots in the first half. So they play a lot of different guys up front. So they'll have a lot of uh, – they, they, they won't get fatigued because they'll have a lot of depth up front. Yeah. Well, I know me and Taylor were at the Opelika game, and uh, the O-line did amazing. Uh, what did you think they did in that game? You know, it, they, had, they created a lot of holes for Omar and were able to um, let the quarterback have time in the pocket. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things there is we just – we ran a lot of outside zone. Uh, you know, that Opelika has number 96. It's committed to Auburn has a lot of SEC offers. And we really just started out uh, running a lot of outside zone that would help create some space for our backs. And so we did a really good job of working our gaps and getting our eyes in the right spot and, and working our steps and, and picking up who we're supposed to pick up. And, and I thought that helped. We widened it out a little bit and helped, you know, get to the perimeter a little bit more. And I, I think that helped. Instead of just yeah. running it right at ninety six. Yeah. All right, Max, you got you got questions now? Yes, sir. I got questions. Good morning, coach. Um, so I wanted to talk about I usually on this show I usually highlight one or two players um to ask you about. And I wanted to actually ask you about the two players that me and Taylor talked about in our uh pregame show for the Opelika game. Jalen Foster and Hugh Bodiford. Jalen playing at center and then Hugh Bodiford playing at tackle. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about um, how they blossomed into real leaders on this offensive line. And I wanted to ask, how would you describe their specific development, as well as this offensive line as a whole throughout the season? How would you describe how they've developed and improved? Well, Jalen's been with me for three years. Uh, this is my third year at Auburn High. So he's one of the guys that's been with me for, for three years. So I've been able to see Jalen grow and develop uh, from last from two years ago when he was a sophomore, not getting a lot of reps to – to last year starting at center with the group that we had that had so much experience to this year becoming the leader of the offensive line. He's really growing into that role, uh, especially over the last couple of weeks, done a really good job of just getting those guys to believe and, and doing what we needed to do and, and starting to, you know, see some – we're starting to see some fruit of that. And he's doing a really good job being a leader. And I tell people, you won't find a more athletic center in the state of Alabama. He is so athletic. Uh, he, he can he can move as good as any kid I've ever coached. Uh, you know, he's done a really good job of, of getting better and just he's he's got a lot of strength and a lot of size, but, you know, he's still got ways to go to get better, and, and that's a good thing because he's just a junior. So I, I look forward to seeing what he can do as the year goes on. But he's one of those kids that I can I can coach as hard as I need to, and he's just going to, yes, sir, and, and, and do what you asked and, Really good. I, I'd like to highlight one of our other offensive linemen, Clem Womack. He's done a really good job this year. Uh, he is so good outside at the left tackle. I've been fortunate. This is uh, the third year here, and I've 
I've went with, you know, Drew Bobo two years ago at left tackle, and then last year, Braden Joyner. And I don't think we've missed anything with Clem Womack at left tackle. And that says a lot, knowing that Drew's at Georgia and, and Braden's at Auburn. Uh, I think we hadn't missed a beat with Clem. Clem does a really good job. He's really coachable. And I tell him all the time, he's going 100 miles an hour out there on the field. So sometimes – he might block the wrong guy, and he's not going to get in trouble just because he's just going to go 100 miles an hour. And that's what he tries to teach these young guys, these 10th graders, that, you know, sometimes they're afraid to make a mistake. And, and he, you know, he, does, he doesn't care if he makes mistakes. Not that he doesn't care. He just – he's going full speed, and he's going to do his job. And, you know, if you have to fix him, he's going to fix it and, and be right. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, like my co-host Reed said earlier – excuse me, Reese said earlier uh, – this offensive line is very experienced, and I wanted to ask you, uh, how does that help, especially with, like, you know, stuff going on with the quarterback position and, you know, you have such a good running back core. How does that help having such an experienced offensive line? Well, you know, I think it helps because uh, they got a lot of reps last year. Uh, they got a lot of reps in practice because we go A group and B group, and that group, this group right here pretty much was all our B group except for, Jalen, and so they got a lot of good experience at practice, a lot of good experience in JV games, a lot of good experience, you know, in the back end of games last year. And I think that helps because they were behind a lot of experience last year. So I think it helps them seeing things that, you know, they got to see at full speed last year that helps them in a game type situation this year. And I, I think the same thing's happening right now with our 10th graders. We're getting a lot of full speed reps at practice, a lot of full speed reps on Monday nights. There's a lot of 10th graders that are having to grow up pretty fast. And I think that'll help as we, as we move into the future. Uh, I think that helps a lot. Uh, and I think it helps with you see things at practice, but when you see things in a game, it's so much faster, so much different. And I think that's helped our guys get better as the year goes on. It helps, helps our backs and, and our quarterback as well. Yes, sir. And then um, I asked Coach Chaney this last week, but – Going into that last drive against Opelika, you're at your own 38 with under three minutes to go. Were there any specific words that you told the offensive line before they took the field and helped lead Auburn to victory? Well, I just told them it was their time to shine. Uh, it's their time to go and, and, and do what we needed to do. And, uh, you know, we went down 13 and, and got back under the tent uh, over there on the sideline uh, right after we went back down 13. And we had went out, I think we went three and out. And you could just see in their eyes like a little worry. And then we went out and we hit that big third down pass to Cody uh, that was a big deal. And I think that gave our, our offense some life. And then we scored with 448 or whatever it was to go and go back, go down by six. I think when they came off to the sideline, I said, guys, this defense is supposed to stop them, go three and out. We're supposed to go drive it down and score and win this ball game. I think that gave them some confidence. But I think there was confidence in the whole offense because of the guys that we have out there, not just the offensive line, but guys like Henry Allen that, you know, he's he's going out there and, 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 and the game's not too big. And Omar, game's not too big. And Jalen Foster and some of those guys that just been out there in those atmospheres. And I, I told somebody this week, you know, I don't – I wouldn't put our team against anybody uh, down because they've been so resilient. We've been in so many tight ball games that uh, we've just done a really good job of fighting back. And that, to me, that shows – uh, resiliency and, and and just a good fight out of a football team. Yes, sir. I mean, you talk about resiliency. I I wasn't able to go to the Opelika game, but I went to the Ramsey one the week before. And that game, too, I mean, y'all were down, you know, going into halftime and then showed the resiliency coming back out and immediately scoring. Um, but I want to harp on a little bit more of, like, the scheme and, like, the fundamentals of the offensive line here. Um, but first I want to talk about with a new quarterback coming in and Henry Allen after week two of the season, uh, did that change anything on the offensive line, whether it's the scheme y'all practice or the plays y'all run with a more, you know, run, run based, uh, quarterback at Henry, was there anything that changed? Well, not really. Uh, we, we basically built our offense. We're going to build our offense around our strength. I think that's what Will Wagner is really good at. And, and I've worked with him. This is my fifth year. He is really good at building a our offense around our strengths. And so we came in, and when we had to change the offense, we did everything that we could to change the offense without making it complicated or making it difficult on everybody. So our offensive line, nothing changed. Uh, we still run all the same kind of schemes. All that We never changed rules on anybody. And I think that helped us up front 
have a smooth transition from going to a more, uh, you know, 10 personnel uh, pass and run friendly to more of a 12 personnel with two tight ends or two cruisers and, and being more run friendly. Uh, but it, it, that's what helped us more than anything. Our offensive line, nothing changed for them. Uh, you know, we, nothing has changed. We're, we're still the same and still doing a lot of the same things. Now, uh, some of the movement in the backfield changes some of the traje- trajectory of where the linebackers go, but it doesn't change our step. Sometimes maybe that linebacker is not where he would be if we, we didn't have so much motion in the backfield. Some, that it really helps us sometimes because it can, it can help that linebacker be wrong and, you know, our, our offensive line still do what they're supposed to be doing. And, and, and I've had to teach that to him, like, okay, that linebacker might not be in the spot he was going to be in because he's, he's following the quarterback or the cruisers. But, you know, it's at the end of the day, if they're over there and we're running left and they're to the right, we're okay. Let's, let's just keep working our track. So not much has changed for them. Just, just get on somebody and stay on somebody. Yes, sir. And then I also wanted to ask, um, you know, a lot of people do think, you know, just a casual viewer of football would think that blocking is just snapping the ball and then just trying to push the defense as far as possible. But there's a lot more to it. You know, for example, there's a big difference between the blocking schemes of a run play and the blocking scheme of a pass play. Coach Stanford, could you please explain uh, what the difference between those two schemes are, at least for, you know, y'all's team? Well, you know, we run two different types of run plays. We run a zone scheme and we run gap scheme. So you really – run zone scheme is where you're going to – if we're running to the right, your eyes are going to be in your right gap to the right – to the gap right – to the right – your right side. Mm-hmm. And you're going to pick up what comes. You know, 15 years ago, defenses may have stayed in the same spot. But now, you know, you might have a defender in the gap to your right that may slant across into your gap to your left. So what you got to do is you keep your eyes – on your gap. And so even though that guy slanted across your face, he's not yours. He's the next guy's because he's got the gap to your right. So that's kind of how zone works. We've got our eyes in our gap. We're working our tracks. And whatever comes in our gap, that's what we're going to pick up. So we run an inside zone and outside zone and have a different variations off of it. And then we have a gap scheme run play or have gap scheme run plays where basically you have a – you still have a gap, uh, but it's more of your front side's going to – down block, uh, and then you're going to have a pull. You're going to have a, a pull to kick, and you're going to have a, a pull that's going to wrap up on the first side or the first linebacker on the front side. So it's really unique to be able to run both and to be good at both, and I think our offensive line has done a good job of, of getting better at both of those. And so that's our, our run game. And then pass, you know, pass protection, you're going to have uh, – we've got three – well, actually five different calls on pass protections that we run that uh, are more passive. And I say more passive. Like, I, I try to teach our guys, okay, if we're running the football, we're going to be more aggressive. Uh, and if you're passing the ball, you're going to be more passive. And it's not because it's a pass. It's just you want guys to come to you on a pass protection instead of going at them because your job is really just to stay between you and the quarterback. If you can stay between you and the quarterback, you've done your job. So you, you kind of set back on that and, and be a little bit more passive so that you can – keep your self position between you and the quarterback. So it's it's different, uh, but I think our guys do a really good job of understanding and knowing. And uh, I really just want to – I'll give credit to our defense. Like our defense at practice, going against our defense, prepares us so much in pass protection because we see everything from our defense. And we see it all from spring practice all the way into fall camp. But we've, we've seen it just about everything that we could see. And so that helps our def- our offensive line, I think, as much as anything because we're going against the best of the best in the state. Yes, sir. And then my uh, last question for you is going to be, uh, going into y'all's biggest game of the season so far against undefeated number one in 7A Central, is there anything that changes in practice when it comes to preparing for the number one team in 7A as compared to other teams y'all played? Uh, well, I don't think we'll change anything. We're a routine ca- type of guys as coaches that we're not going to change anything. But I do think our mindset changes as pri- as players because we know what we got up, up against. And I think if you can't come out there on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and be as excited as you can be to practice, uh, something's wrong with you because you know what you got going against. And so it's a big chance, big opportunity. I mean, I know Coach Wagner told our offensive guys yesterday, you know, a lot of people grow up and, and, and want to play football and, and live for games like this right here and, and not very many people in the state get to play in these type of environments, these type of atmospheres. And so I think going into practice, I think our intensity will be a little bit higher. 
our focus will be a little bit higher and our guys will just be willing to learn and listen so that they can have the best opportunity they could have Friday night when we play uh, in the best environment in the state of Alabama at Duck Sanford. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Coach. Yes, sir. Now, my right. next, co- my next to- co-host, Taylor Gottney. Take it away. Good morning, Coach. I hope you're having an amazing morning this morning, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm known as kind of the personal question kind of guy on this podcast. And with that, um, what does it mean to teach in such a great school system and the city that you actually graduated college from? Uh, you know, it has just been a blessing. I, I, when I first took this job three years ago, when I first started teaching in the classroom, uh, I, I I think I came home, told my wife, told everybody, like, it's almost unrealistic how, how great this school system is. Uh, you know, kids are just – so well behaved kids want to learn and kids want to do their best in the classroom so that's been an amazing uh opportunity and the people you work with are so professional you're working with the best of the best this is the best school system in the state and then being able to come back to auburn where we graduated i actually met my wife here and it was a dream that we'd always talked about coming back to auburn and i had opportunities you know before but didn't take them and and coming back here, it's like, okay, it's a dream come true. We got a, we moved. We had a uh, five-year-old, and now he's now seven, and he's eating it up, like coming back and going to Auburn games. And, I mean, he'll go to an Auburn soccer game. And, you know, and we're not even big soccer fans, but just being able to go to anything and everything Auburn uh, has been fun. We love it. Uh, it's It's been a blessing for our family because we have always been big Auburn fans and always come back to Auburn, but being here now and, and – just being able to live here and, and be a part of the community is just an amazing experience. Yes, sir. Well, I know we're all glad to have you in Auburn, and it really is just an amazing community. It's hard to leave. It's hard to come back and just see how different it is. But, I mean, we all know and love it. Um, but I do want to ask, what is your relationship with the other offensive line coach, Coach Wayne Parnell? Uh, so, Coach Parnell and I have been together for five years. Uh, we started – I started at Oxford with him uh, – with Coach Etheridge at the same year that Coach Etheridge got there. I think Coach Parnell got there a little bit before I did. Uh, and he was helping with receivers. So, he is, uh, he's been one that's been been with Coach Wagner. He played for Coach Wagner in high school. And so, he's been with Coach Wagner his whole career. Uh, he was at Talladega for a couple years away from Coach Wagner, I think, when he first graduated from college. But other than that, he's been with Coach Wagner his whole career. So, uh, we have a great relationship. We, uh, we've He does a really good job of helping me out on, on – practice and help me do a lot of things that handling a lot of the younger guys uh especially when we get them in the spring we'll take our uh, our ninth graders that are coming over for spring i'll hand them over to him so that i can work with our older guys and he worked with our younger guys but he's got a really good handle on this offense because he's been a part of it for i guess 11 10 11 years however long it's been since he's been in high school so uh he's he's a really good guy and really good friend uh and we've we've got a great relationship Yes, sir. That's awesome to hear. And I feel like the players, you know, see that, like your O-linemen see that, and so that they can have a better relationship with each other. And going with that, I want to ask, what is your, like, coaching mentality, and what do you do to try to form relationships with your players? Well, I've always, my coaching mentality is always, I'm going to coach you hard, but I'm going to love you hard first. Uh, I, I really believe that if you, if you don't, if a kid doesn't know that you love them, then you uh, you can't coach them hard but if they know that you love them then you can coach them as hard as you want to and I feel like that's my mentality uh I think I try to do a really good job when they're young to love on them and and just to you know let them know that I their mistakes are okay and you know I have a lot of 10th graders that I'm getting a lot of reps with right now and I'm not near as hard on them and I, I, I show them that I care show them that I'm trying to help them and that way whenever I need them uh in a year or maybe in a couple of months or however, you know, whatever time it is, time frame it is from the time I get them to the time I need them. I, you know, they realize that I care about them. Uh, I think I do a really good job with relationships with kids, just uh, finding that niche with each kid to, to try to have a relationship with them. Cause all kids are different and you know, you're not going to reach all of them, but you try to reach as many as you can. And I think, I've done a really good job with that with this group. We've got a great relationship with this offensive line. 
And it really starts with Jalen Foster and, and the, having him for three years and the relationship that we built uh, together. And I tell people all the time, I don't know that I've had a kid that's rode more in my vehicle than he has because <laughs> he lives across from me and the neighborhood across from me. So there's been times where he'd ride with me in the morning practice and, and things of that nature. And we just, you know, a lot of times when we ride together, he, we don't talk about football. We talk about life and things of that nature. I think that helps because uh, you got to, you got to separate football from life. And uh, sometimes, you know, you just got to let them know how important life is uh, and not it's, – it's more important than football. Yes, sir. We actually talked about Coach Chaney last week about that. And he was talking about the same thing, you know, like the stress of the game of football, you know, being under the bright lights, big matchups coming up. Sometimes when you're walking to the weight room, you're driving home, like you said with Jalen, you just got to talk about life and kind of shift away from the game of football to just leave, like alleviate their mind and get their stress down, you know. But I kind of want to um, switch here. How awesome is it to be a baseball coach for the JV baseball team as well? And how do you balance that with being a teacher and a football coach? Well, uh, it's kind of ironic. When I moved here, my best friend from college, uh, Travis Yarbrough, is the JV head coach. And he and I have known each other for, I guess, since 2007, we met each other in, in college and, and he was in my wedding and I was in his wedding. So they gave me the opportunity to do JV baseball and, and really just spend time with him because we hadn't got to spend a lot of time together over the last 10 years or so. So uh, it's been a, an amazing experience and I get to see different kids because not all kid, not all of our JV baseball kids play football. So I get to see different types of kids and different kids and situations. So you get to learn different kids. Uh, and so it's it's awesome, and it, it kind of works hand-in-hand hand with football because it usually happens. We do tryouts uh, for JV baseball the week after we finish football, and then uh, about the time JV football JV baseball ends, it's it's about a week a week later is when spring practice starts. So it works hand-in-hand hand with football. Uh, it keeps me busy uh, throughout the year, and I, I tell people I don't know. You know, I, I may be the busiest coach in, in Auburn uh, other than maybe <laughs> some of our cross-country and track coaches, but – uh, you know, it's it's awesome. Uh, Coach Yarbrough and, and what he does with that team and the uh, culture that we have is, is awesome. And Coach Simo, it really starts with Coach Simo and TC and, and some of Comby and some of those guys that's around the staff. Like, it's a, it's a good atmosphere to be around, so it's not stressful. Uh, but it helps it helps me in having a, a different, I guess, atmosphere other than football because football is so intense, so stressful that – you know, it's, it's fun, and I love competing. I love to compete. Uh, you know, it gives me an opportunity to be able to compete. It's nothing like waking up on a Saturday morning, going and playing uh, somewhere off or, or maybe it be at home and playing a, a doubleheader and winning both of those games and, and, you know, just whatever it may be, just being able to compete. Uh, but it does, you know, you do have to strategically plan uh, to be a teacher and a coach. And so I think you have to work hard in the classroom. I've always said that you've got to – separate the classroom from, from coaching. But I was told from a uh, Hall of Fame coach when I first graduated college, uh, his name's Steve Giddens. He's a Hall of Fame coach at Lionville High School. He was actually my rifle in high school. But he uh, he told me, he said, you'll never be a good coach unless you're a good teacher. So I took that uh, advice from him that, that day, and, and, and I've stuck with that for the rest of my career. And and I think, you know, I try to do a great job at both. Uh, I feel like you got to do – you can't be good at one without being good at the other. Yes, sir. I mean, that's truly awesome to see. And speaking of uh, your last answer when you said, you know, got to be a great teacher, Ash, this is my last question. Um, how does it feel to teach students at the junior high in math class and then be able to see those guys maybe come to the high school to play football or go to the baseball diamond to pl play for the JV baseball team? How does that, that like, dynamic work teaching your own players? Uh, I think it's really great. So you already have a relationship with those guys because there's a lot of guys on that field that I'll never coach. And, I, I mean, I say, like, as far as football, like receivers, I'm never going to coach Josh Askew. Uh, I'm not a receivers coach. I'm, I probably won't be a receivers coach uh, while he's in school. And so, you know, I, but I, he ha I had him in class. And so I have that relationship with him. We get out on the field that I can – I can talk to him or I can I can say something to him to try to help motivate him because I've had him in class. So building those relationships in the classroom and then seeing him out on the field uh, is awesome. So I remember, you know, 
just think of Josh last year in the spring game uh, coming out from ninth grade, and he was in my class at that point because he was, you know, a, an aspiring 10th grader, but in the spring game had that long touchdown. I don't know if you all remember it, but it was right there at the end of the spring game, and we threw the ball, and he caught it and went, I don't know if it was 80 yards, whatever it was, but I was one of the first ones to go see uh, after he he made that play, and that was a big deal for me because I had a relationship with that kid. And it goes from, you know, talking about baseball, I think that's one of the things, too, that I enjoy. Because, like, Jackson Mills, like, I don't coach de- defensive backs, but I have a great relationship with Jackson Mills for me coaching him in baseball. And when he had an interception for a touchdown, uh, I can't remember what game that was, or had a big interception. I think it was Enterprise, maybe. Uh, it was, you know, I was one of the first ones to run down there and celebrate him. And that relationship that I had with him was a big deal. And, and I, I, last week, Jackson had one of the biggest plays of the game that nobody will probably ever talk about uh, is whenever they punted to us right there at the end. And he caught – he fair caught the ball, had to catch it backwards, running backwards. And like you said, we started at 38. He don't catch that ball. I mean, we're probably starting that – the way that ball is rolling, it's probably going to roll either to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, and him catching it that way – and I, being able to have that relationship with him and see him after that, and then two or three times this week, I told him how big of a play that was. So just relationships with kids, man. Like, you you get to spend time with kids in a different atmosphere, and then you see them on the football field or on the baseball field. It's it's just different because they know that you care about them in the classroom. So they know that you care about their, their well-being, not just about what they're doing for you on the field. Yes, sir. That was very special to hear. And that's actually all my questions. So, Reese, you can take them away. Uh, I don't know, Max. Do you have any other questions? I don't have any other questions. Uh, I have one quick question, Coach. Uh, for those who want to be like students that are listening to the podcast that want to be offensive linemen, or you know, play on the baseball diamond, or just want to be athletes in general, what uh, advice would you give to them? Well, you know, first of all, uh, I say it like I teach, like I tell my son, you know, try anything and try everything. Oh. Uh, you know, don't hold back. One of these days, you're going to look back and have regrets for things you didn't do. You'll never – you've hardly ever looked back and have regrets on the things you did do. So, uh, I think it's just one of those things where you don't want to have a regret that you – to do something that you never did. And so, uh, that's just – I just say, you know, you try to – try whatever you can and do whatever you can. And if you have a passion for something, you need to pursue it. And I think that's just important – for all people, and I think that's people at all ages. I think that's advice for them. So, if you have a passion for something, try it. And and you know, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, had situations like that in my life before too. So, but at the end of the day, you won't have regrets if you did try it because you did everything you could. Yes, sir. And then um, last question is going to be: um, Are there is there anything you want to tell the fans? You know, going into this big week against Central, uh, is there anything you want to tell the fans before um, you leave the podcast? Well, you know, the biggest thing we need this week is we need a, a a very great crowd, which I think we'll have. And and I need the, you know, we need all the support we can get for these kids because I think we need to create the uh, the best home field advantage in the state of Alabama Friday night. And we play at Duck Sanford uh, so that we can set, show our support for our guys that that laid on the line day in and day out. That will be laying on the line at seven o'clock next Friday night, Duck Sanford, and you know just. Come out and, and do everything that you can to try to give us that home field advantage. Yes, sir. I can't wait. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank y'all. Well, that's going to do it for episode eight of Play Callers. Uh, Coach, thank you for joining us on this beautiful Saturday. I hope you enjoy the game later and uh, go Tigers. Go Tigers. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of Play Callers. Be sure to check out our episodes dropping every Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Central. Also be sure to check out our other podcast, The Tiger's End, where we dive into the world of sports. Be sure to check out those episodes coming out every Monday at 3.30 p.m. Central. Thanks for listening.